Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, Don't Be a Lemming, with Brian Bush. We talk about the value of networks and connecting people, how he has a purpose, not a career, and the joy of embarrassing Porsche drivers at headlights in his rally version Skoda. Brian is a sales slash business development and relationship specialist, having worked in a number of areas across the private and public sectors. From involvement in growing business, small to large, to creating and growing his own ventures, Brian has a real passion for business. Driven by purpose, able to motivate and inspire others, Brian brings connection to a team or business, ensuring a positive culture can exist to enhance efficiency and therefore profit. A very well-networked individual, Brian always brings his extensive connections to all projects and businesses that he works with and uses strategic partnerships to drive forward opportunity. Good morning to you, Brian. How are you doing today? I am very well, thank you. How are you both? Can he? Yeah, good. It's not quite as sunny today, but we don't mind that. It's the worst thing, so. No, yesterday was nice and sunny, yet cold, mm. I found. Yeah, so I was yeah, football yeah. coaching yesterday and it was mm. shorts. Bad decision. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we went to uh, watch my little boy play rugby, but we weren't allowed out of the car, so we were quite snuggly. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's probably a good choice. Good way to watch. <laughs> yeah. So let's go with our first question. When you were little, did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? I did, in fact, nailed on know what I want to be. What I wanted to be when I growed up, um, which is how we said it then, when I growed up, <laughs> um, I wanted to be a policeman. Mm. And I wanted to be a policeman for uh, two pretty specific reasons. And from the age of about four, I guess. Uh, and one was because my dad was. Uh, and I used to see my dad. Um, I used to see my dad, which is one thing. That was that was positive in itself. Um, but I used to see him go off to work with his sort of tunic over his, um, over his shoulder. And, and policing was around a lot. Um, and also I had a... I had and still have a real fascination for the law uh, and kind of people upholding it and the the, the sort of structure of uh, of legal frameworks. I, I really, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm even sounding, starting to bore myself in my own head saying that. <laughs> but <laughs> believe me, it's exciting. <laughs> um, I like the law. I like the law a lot. I think it's a really powerful tool that people misunderstand Um uh, and so on. So yeah, policeman was the was the career for me. Never got to be one. Colour blind. Couldn't get him. Yeah, that sucks. So my twenty one year old self uh, went to join the police force, and then um, I already knew I was colour blind, but I didn't think it would kind of stop me getting in really, mm-hmm. and it, it did. Um, and being the the son of a police officer, that they, they like you to, to join the police because you kind of know a lot of it already. So. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they were very keen for me to get in, but, you know, there's some rules you can't bend, really. Yeah. And probably still the case sta- now? I think they've uh, relaxed it um, a bit. I mean, the big problem at the time was um, not race relations, as people might believe in those days, um, but more the aspect that, um, you know, you could stand in court and I could quite rightly say, oh, yes, the, the gentleman in a green coat was running away, and I say, well, actually, it was brown. And I'll say, no, it was green, because that's what I think, you know, so... Mm. evidentially you kind of understand the reasoning for it really yeah mm. ah. so a big disappointment all of those years of wanting what was what was the next step well it was always um I, I was I was running some retail shops by that time because I've kind of always been one of those people that like to work and I like to get on really I'm not going to sit around kind of feeling too sorry for myself or <clears throat> And my mouth had always got me into everything, really, and normally far quicker than my brain. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So I, I think up until the age of about, I don't know, probably about 39 or 40, my mouth always used to engage ahead of my brain. And now my brain tends to engage a little bit quicker, although not always quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as we might discover during the course of the next you know, few minutes. <laughs> so I'd, um, I'd kind of got on with being able to relationship develop, really. I, I could get people to buy stuff. Mm. Um, and also in our younger selves, we never understand these qualities and skills at all, really. So I didn't know what I was doing or what I could do, but um, I could do it and mm-hmm. I was pretty successful at it. So um, I sort of, I guess I had a bit of a kickback um, stage after not getting into the police because I, I, I walked out of my job pretty instantly, not long afterwards, because I fell out with the MD over something trivial on both sides. But I just decided, it's the first, the only time I've ever walked out of a job in my life. Mm. Um, and I literally did just have a mass fall. And this was the guy who owned all the, the shops that I was running. Um, I, I literally got off the phone to him, having had an argument with him and said, I'm off and walked out of the store but then interesting walked across the road picked up the um went to a phone box this is really dating day, it. Yeah. <laughs> and a phone box yeah and what you know young people will now see is a defibrillator <laughs> um, uh and um I, I started making calls uh, and one of the calls was to um get a job as a car salesman so i did that instead i, I phoned someone up i knew that i used to work for said what well, what have you got and he said, the only job I've got is a car salesman. Have you ever sold cars? I, of course, said, yes. Um, having never sold one, <laughs> it's a car. People are going to drive it. You know, what, what else do you need to know? It's got some doors. Um, so I went and sold Skoda. Not Ooh. the not the company, just individual versions, individual <laughs> products, um, which is pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. And um, then I gained not only a love for the law, but a love for a Skoda motor vehicle as well because they were great fun, brilliant in the snow. So I, I, I sold a lot of Skodas and kind of got quite good at that, really, and enjoyed it. Mm. And it was great when the sun lambasted the Skoda because it, um, it cleared our stocks. It was brilliant. All that sort of um, uh, keeping your hands warm on the back of a Skoda, pushing it and all that stuff, you know. It's oh, great, funny. great for business. Well, they had really heated windscreen, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep your hands warm when you're pushing it. <laughs> yeah. there, were, there were some great jokes, but mm. there were some great people coming in with their three series BMWs and, you know, Ford whatevers and Vauxhall whatevers and saying, I'd like to buy one of those, please. So that was great, really mm. great. Yeah, I remember um, we were living in Germany when the, the Berlin Wall came down and the borders were opened and within days we were seeing those, you know, probably not as fancy as the ones you were selling mm. but Skodas and Larders you know mm. coming coming through our neighborhood it was really fascinating yeah and I I I, I learned and it's one of these things you, you learn it a long while ago and I can't I remember whether I dreamt it one night and completely made it up or mm. I did in fact learn this um that in Czechoslovakia with the Skoda you would literally drive one in to a kind of block building and then they just give you another one you know none of that showroom nonsense none of that mm-hmm. choose the electric yeah the heated rear window and stuff <laughs> um you just get another one and if it wasn't your color then you know that's the that's the four wheels that's going to get you from a to b mm. but i did like the skoda I, I used to have a little um in my more childish days because skoda were pretty um prolific at rallying as well so i i had a rally skoda for a while which had come from skoda uk which we had at our dealership and i drove that around for a while and it was a porsche killer it really was <laughs> um it was it was like a you know it's just a beast of a car but just looked like a skoda um and I had some fun in that when I had it, particularly with Paul's drivers as well. <laughs> <laughs> All that childish racing away from the traffic lights nonsense that yeah. some of us did when we were stupid youths as well. <laughs> Is this where your uh, love of the law came in then? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And occasionally bending the rules of it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. But obviously if you're caught, that's perfectly appropriate for you to be fined and, mm. and so on. Yeah, yes, but also perfectly fine not to be caught. <laughs> <laughs> Innocent until caught. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wrap, uh, wrap all sorts of caveats around that. Yeah. <laughs> do not break the law. There we go. Don't break the law, children. Is that the title of this podcast then, do you think? Yeah. Do not break the law. Yeah. That sort of flies in the face of piracy, though, doesn't it? Really. 
oh. our, our joint love of piracy. You know, you've got to break a few laws, rules. No, I think it's rules, not necessarily laws. Yeah. Um, okay. And it's not breaking sometimes. It's just bending them. Yeah. And sometimes pointing out the blindingly obvious as well. Mm. There's a lot of pointing out the blindingly obvious going mm-hmm. on at the moment. Mm-hmm. I think we need a lot of that. Mm. I, I, I'm quite stunned sometimes by people's views and opinions, I think is the politest way to put it. Mm. And what they may or may not believe in relation to the big wide world. Yeah, I think there's a lot of high level, so as they go as far to say, manipulation about mm. what we should and should not believe. Yeah, I think that's always been evident, hasn't it, really? I think it's uh, getting think, worse, though. It just seems getting worse and worse. I think when politics developed its need to have a person with big teeth <clears throat> as, a, as some sort of Beverly Hills 90210 series mm. um, and... Um, I think that's just grown and grown that aspect where it's not re- it doesn't really matter what they're saying it just matters that they look good saying it um, uh, and that's where politics started to take a bit of a nosedive I think mm. and it just seems to have flattened out and spread itself even thinner and thinner really and people's um, willingness to just herd along behind that has grown and grown I think to an almost alarming rate now it's like we just don't care people don't care you know, society at large seems not to care what goes on around it. Yeah, I think That's there's sad. a level of learned helplessness in there, though. It's mm. like, what can one person do? I think we've yeah. lost the ability to disagree mm. constructively mm. Um, and debate and reason and critical think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think back on times where my, my love of the law has um, helped me to take on big companies who have wronged me and very successfully as well. Um, And I've never been, I've never been a person who thinks anything other than, you know, what I need to do rather than a large company that has done the wrong thing. I don't ever think, Oh, they should get away with that or they're too big to go for. I just think, well, the law allows me to go for them. Therefore I will. And then that kind of winds back to some of that legal fascination that I have because it's a powerful tool that does protect us and allow us certain, you know, absolute freedoms in this country, but also that the law is structured that it protects us from being harmed or having wrong done against us. Whether people get away with that or not is secondary to the, the framework of the law. Um, but the law is there to protect you. Uh, and I've used that to my advantage many times. Um and I think it's always true in life as well that, you know, what one person can persuade another to join them uh, and then two people can persuade two and so on and so on. So there's always something can be done. And even a tiny thing is better than nothing, I believe. But I think for a lot of people, they, they don't see that. I think you've only got to run a parish council or something, you know, or a, or a membership group and, you know, say, oh, we're doing an event on the 13th and we need everybody to bake cakes or something and everybody puts their hand up and then, you know, 97% of them slowly drop out before the event happens and don't do anything and the 3% do everything. Mm-hmm. That just happens, you know, even at, even at low level. So it happens at large level in the same way. Yeah. Absolutely. Burned helplessness. I like that phrase. Mm. Mm. I'm going. I'm going to ask people that question whenever next I'm organising something and say, "Are you going to help or are you going to adopt learned helplessness?" <laughs> it's interesting. Just to call them out early on. Mm. Yeah, interesting concept. Mm. Um, whereby you don't think you have any power, so you just acquiesce. Yeah. So I see organisations full of people with that. Mm. They've tried and tried and tried and then they've given up and then just move paper around and get paid. Yeah. Yeah. I've worked in those organizations occasionally. Not often because you kind of get, you know, I don't really fit in with those type of people. Some of them I understand. I understand their position. I can understand their position whilst not agree with it, agreeing mm-hmm. with it. And that's another thing we seem to have a problem with in society generally. Yeah. Disagreeing with someone's position. Um, and then thinking they're wrong, therefore I, you know, I am right. I think that's difficulty. And you know, there's some very large political situations around the world that could do with a little bit more understanding in that regard. Yep. Mm. We watched that uh, 
that's a social dilemma yeah um it's like a, a program on netflix about so how social media influences people mm. and it's terrifying really mm. it is i think um i think it's also terrifying what people can believe mm. um I, I tend to I, I tend to look at life by taking lots of different opinions and facts from lots of different areas. I, I won't just, for instance, watch BBC News and think that is what hap is happening there because I think that's very dangerous. Mm. You know, I, I think um, I've got to say this because we talked about Marmite earlier, which I detest. I've got to just <laughs> drop that in. I feel like I'm serving a, a community purpose in doing that. But the Daily Mail, the Daily Mail is another thing that I think we should ban uh, and the, the world would be a far better place because people who read it and believe that to be the truth um, without sense checking it really is is difficult. But that's true of any, you know, media, any, any outlet, really, uh, Twitter feeds and so on. You see it in black and white and it becomes the truth. Mm. That's quite dangerous. Yeah, it's echo chamber, mm. isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, it can also be where a lot of that lethargy comes from as well for, for people thinking, well, actually, you know, what can I do against this great monolithic beast that um, oversees us all and governs us? Um, but that's what that's what the infrastructure wants, isn't it? That's what society, those that lead us, require. Nice little nodding lemmings ready to take our place <laughs> next to the cliff top and, and watch our good friend John dive over the top and then think, why is he doing that? Oh, look, I think I will. I think I'm next. Mm. No, it is. It's fascinating stuff. It's, don't, don't be a lemming, children. <laughs> don't be a lemming. That's another good title for this podcast. Mm. Yeah, don't be a lemming. <clears throat> or a lemon. <laughs> or a lemon. Don't be a lemon. Mind you, swimming around in gin. That's interesting, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it's worse, there's worse things <laughs> <laughs> made into lemon drizzle cake mm. yeah mm. <laughs> but we do see that a lot don't we that it's <clears throat> i mean i'd admit as well being in being quite idealistic starting in the corporate world thinking oh i could i can see this as an opportunity or here's an idea strategically that would take us in a good direction or grow sales and and after a while you just think you get worn down by that rigidity and lack of willingness to try different things. Mm. And you either yeah. just become the the lemming that just says, oh, it's not worth it. Then you get paid and carried on. Or you just say, well, screw this, I'm leaping. <laughs> and, and if somewhere else doesn't fit me, then I'll set up my own business and do yeah. something about it instead. And I think yeah, and I think more. You've also got a difficulty of the people in the room that everyone else dislikes, mm. you know, whether quite aggressively because you're the big problem or even at mild level because you're the guy or the, the girl, the person that keeps saying, hang on, mm. why don't we try this? Why don't we yes. do this? Mm. So you, you, you kind of become a voice of one, which is not always an easy place to be. I find mm. in some of my life I have been a voice of one. And it doesn't bother me too much, but sometimes, you know, it's you, you do have to do that thing. You've either got to move on or set your own thing up, most likely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, difficult spaces. Yeah. So moving from embarrassing Porsche owners <laughs> at traffic lights. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, <clears throat> what came next? You must, did you move on from that? Yeah, I, I moved around quite a lot, really. Um, I never really <clears throat> i think it's that it's that later in life thing that hindsight thing you know is a is a great asset um but we never understand it and i i would get a job um i'd normally talk my way into one i didn't really used to apply for much i used to just do stuff um something would always turn up you know or something would i, I wouldn't really be looking but something would interest me and i'd find i'd get quite interested quite easily after a p p specific sorry I used to have a friend of mine who could only ever say Pacific as opposed to specific. And I did it myself. So I must drop my line later and maybe send him a pound. Um, <laughs> I, I would just kind of move around. I'd get, I, I realized this now I'd become bored of doing the same thing as mm -hmm. enjoyable as most of my jobs were. <clears throat> Excuse me. And also I think um, I didn't really want to work for anyone. 
but I didn't understand that either. Mm -hmm. So I kind of bumped around. Then I was at a party, and um, at the party, we um, I, I met. I was chatting to a guy at this. Um, friend's party on a Sunday afternoon who was a sales manager at another company and was talking about them and I thought that sounds interesting I, I was working wherever at the time and I was just kind of um getting kind of itchy feet you know um so I went and saw him um I interviewed with him and his MD joined that business uh, and then I stayed there for a, a large number of years um for me really when my career was normally about two years long anyway mm -hmm. um and um we we grew um invested it sold it um and then in 2004 um i came out of that having learned loads and made a bit of cash along the way as well um and, and that was partly because the people we sold it to um had a different direction to the one i believed in and it didn't really focus on customer service in a way that i believe was correct mm -hmm. it was very much profit driven which is perfectly right and proper in business um, but not at the expense of the people you serve, I didn't think. So we didn't really align. Mm -hmm. And that, that just sort of crept up on me over a period of time. And I sat one day, um, my wife and I were renovating an old place at the time. And I, I, on a Saturday morning, I remember this quite vividly, um, I sat and cried because the plumber hadn't turned up or something like that. And I realized I wasn't crying because Colin the plumber hadn't turned up because he was a nice guy, but you know, I don't think we were quite that close. Um, <laughs> and it was um, it, it was fairly obvious there was, you know, something not working, something not happening correctly. And that really made me think, you know, it's time I, time I left. And they tried to throw stuff at me and get me to stay. But I had no idea what I was going to do instead. Mm. But I was resolute that I was going to leave. Um, mm. so, I did, so I guess I said earlier I'd never walked out on anything. But I guess I did a bit then too, although it wasn't slam the door on the, on the way out kind of mm. stuff really. Mm -hmm. But um, I just went out to not really knowing what was going to be next, but knowing there needed to be something. Mm. And then that started my journey of doing my own thing, really. So since 2004, August 2004, I've, I've done lots of things, which has been a really exciting journey. Mm. Uh, and um, now understand that's where my space is. You know, I don't get bored because I don't allow myself to. I can move around. I can work in every every sector I fancy I work with people I like admire and respect um, I work in organizations that serve a purpose to the to the community and the populace generally um, I, I'm fortunate enough to or stubborn enough to make those choices one or the other mm -hmm. whichever way um, and it's great you know as we all know it's got its ups and downs because we've got to make the till ring mm -hmm. um, we have to do that no one else does it for us um, and I think when you come out of these large organizations, you've got, you know, even though I was heading up sales and stuff around that, because that's where I've always been, sales and business development, really. You kind of have people, you know, you've got a bunch of people and, you know, you've got a department over there that builds a website and a department over there that sends people to it to buy stuff and all those things. And then all of a sudden, when you're on your own, you're it. You're mm -hmm. all those departments. Um, and that's a tough gig sometimes. <laughs> you, so, can't just, you can't just call up Barry when your laptop is not working yeah, properly. Yeah. The printer's not working. Shout out to yeah. Barry. <laughs> yeah. Get my mate yeah. Barry in IT. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so think of, you know, come up with a great marketing campaign and go and have a chat with the FD and say, I'd like half a million bucks just to go and <laughs> chuck some stuff at this place. So, oh yeah, so that's got to be my money now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I haven't earned it yet. Oh, okay. I see how that works. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, they're they're always interesting. But I think that teaches us stuff as well. Yeah. So oh, we've had this conversation before, Brian. But if you could enlighten our listeners as to what what jobs you have have now or have yeah, had or have now yeah the have now will probably be quicker <laughs> so uh, now i um am part of a network called the business growth coaches network so i am a business coach uh we are the business growth coaches network .co.uk bgcn.co.uk if anyone is that interested um we're 30 strong now, I believe. A guy called Pete Bassford set it up, having come out of a, a very long, illustrious and successful career, different areas of Lloyd's, uh, and realized that there wasn't enough business support for the lower SME space. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of it out there is pretty poor because anybody can be a business coach. You know, mm -hmm. there's no qualifications needed. It's a bit like being an estate agent. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is a number and you're on right move. Um, mm -hmm. And 
maybe we can come back and do estate agents another day because that's in my Marmite channel, estate agents. <laughs> Don't love them that much, I've got to say. Um, <laughs> m- money, money for old rope, maybe. Maybe, but let's, let's come back to that another day. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, um, um, th- there's, th- there's that, yeah, the aspect for, I'd lost myself a moment there with my excitement about um, vilifying estate agents. <laughs> um, <laughs> Some of my friends are estate agents and they're okay, you know, so we'll caveat that as well. It's all about the law. It's all the legal framework for me, always caveats yeah. um, and never wanting to offend anyone if I can help it as well. So the, um, yeah, coaching. So I do that. So um, uh, I, I work with, um, we work with uh, SMEs, organizations, charities and, and so on. Um, I, I run uh, Bebush Online co.uk and that's about me with um coaching which i still do under my own guise as it were um connection so i I have a very large uh global network i've always developed relationships with people um it's it's been something i've been doing since i was probably four or five years old Mm -hmm. um and later in life you really understand and start to understand the asset value of that network so um i will connect organizations together i'll connect companies into sectors or if someone wants to get in front of you know that company over there then i'll get them in there Uh, and sometimes i do that commercially and paid for and sometimes i do it because i believe it needs to happen um and then the third part for me really um at the moment is uh, is sales and um, helping people with sales strategy. Again, sitting into that connection part a little bit and that coaching part, those two things will feature in there as well, uh, and building sales teams, training people in relation to sales, um, those sorts of areas. And I love sales. I love sales and I love selling. I, I believe it is, uh, it's a subject in the UK that we see negatively uh, and not positively, and it's an absolute must in any organization. You know, if you're a charity, you've got to convince people to come on board to your purpose and that's selling. Mm-hmm. You know, we may not like to call it selling, but it's selling. It's no like trust and relationship building um, and all those things that go with selling. So we, you know, selling needs far more positivity. Than you can. I'm doing a fair bit of work out in the States at the moment, having some really interesting conversations with people um, about that very subject because the, the whole Dale Carnegie line, you know, the invention of insurance sales back in the 18, whatever it was, or 1700s, um, is testament to that very fact that there's a there's a different view of selling um, mm. in other parts of the world. Mm. Um, and I, I'm, I'm out talking to people about um, sales and now starting a, a podcast project um, entitled, no less, Around the World in 80 Sales. Excellent. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> my very good friend, um, Jacob uh, Barrett in uh, Copenhagen was my number one. And um, I'm rolling out a few more as it goes, not least you two <laughs> as well. We're excited about that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's really, uh, I, I think, one of these things where when you talk about sales, it's easy to assume your own opinion on it. Mm. And I think that's sometimes dangerous. And as I talk about sales a lot, I want to I want to challenge myself and I want to go see what the world thinks. Um, mm. And I may be right and I may be wrong, but, you know, the world will tell me that. Uh, sorry, that sounds a bit grandiose, but um, different people around the world in my connection network will tell me that, that I choose. Yeah. Um, and so, some I want as a little bit, you know, my own version of Marmite as well. I want a bit of challenge in there as well. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, and then I, I, I've got... Um, I work with a. I work with um, Barclays very closely around the UK. So I've had a working relationship with them for nine years. Um, we do quite a lot of stuff together. Um, I've got a couple of projects on the go. One is called Under Agency, which is based in young people space and getting them into work. Another one, CAP Certified, that I'm just joining and working with, is about um, protection of children in the online space mm-hmm. um, with uh, correct validation of uh, of a person's identity um, mm-hmm. prior to prior to becoming involved with with children. Um, and um, I, I sort of mentor and assist one or two other businesses and do a bit of stuff in the charity space as well really but it's all people it's all people and relationships for me really sums it up and i think i made the the, the i made the comment to you earlier i, I have a purpose not a career yeah. and I, I look back on my life and i see where that's been very evident when i've moved place to place i'm following a distinct purpose um as opposed to the job 
and I think that helps me clarify my own existence a bit, which at times, you know, you've only got to take a look at my LinkedIn profile has sometimes been a bit difficult because there's a bit to choose from. Yes, we get into, we get into trouble with that as well. Mm. All the time. It's like, Michelle, what do you actually do? James, <laughs> what do you actually do? Mm. Loads of stuff. Yeah. Mm. I, I always want to go back with what do you need? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I can help if, if it's not us we know somebody yeah, guaranteed yeah what, what's what's your biggest problem I'll solve it you know mm. or I'll know someone that will it's kind of I know it's a bit market trader-esque but that's where I live sometimes you know <laughs> on a market Del Boy. Store. yeah there's a there's a bit of that you know I love a car boot sale yeah I love the banter and the, the negotiation the the reality of it oh, and the, the psychology of it a bit as well it's brilliant mm. we and so, yeah, we were dragged, my dad loves a car boot sale and we were dragged around them quite often as a child. And I just found it really boring. Um, <laughs> you know, sort of like, ugh, and it's normally cold. And yeah. yes, and it, they never bought us anything. You know, they just, they never really bought anything, just like to go around and like find out what was going on. And then that's three we were just traipsing around afterwards, bored out of our brains, cold and hungry, no doubt. <laughs> Yes, I've only I've only actually done a couple of car boot sales a long while ago, and the thing that struck me was when you you know you take an estate car along with a bunch of stuff in it, and as you open the boot of the car, it's like three hundred people suddenly dive in the car with you, mm. and start looking at stuff and wanting to buy it and things. I found that a bit weird. Mm. I was almost into um, seal reaction territory, you know. <laughs> 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 it's almost like close quarters combat was um, was mm. was utilized you can tell the professionals though can't you oh yeah yeah it's like they've got lists and you know apps and stuff mm. it's like oh look it looks like something xyz my dad's got really into actual antiquing now i think yeah 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 um, which is really hilarious like how about Every, it everyone's looking for fabergé eggs and clarice cliff is it artwork yeah and- yeah, and, 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 fi- stuff. and finding Cadbury's cream eggs. Yeah. <laughs> like actual Cadbury's cream eggs. Probably, I don't know. <laughs> not, not, not all my jokes are going to be funny. The law of averages won't permit it as much as I wish it would. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a level of, um, going back to the cream eggs, I think there's a level of um, grieving after Easter when they're not so prolific in the shops because mm. I, do, I yeah. do enjoy one. And with, with all these things like, you know, chocolate bars and and cream eggs and all this stuff do our hands get bigger or do those items get smaller? Oh, yeah no i'm not convinced. sure which it is i think it's a it's a psychological play on us that we assume our hands get bigger but actually they just make them smaller and we all just assume it's us getting bigger yeah. maybe that's it's, the biggest con in history bigger than whether we actually landed on the moon or not it is i remember reading something about i can't remember if it was in the maybe it was in the 90s about chocolate bar size and it was a case of, because I definitely think cream eggs, I don't remember having being able to just pop them in my mouth like Maltesers <laughs> almost. <laughs> Although I have got yeah. bigger. <laughs> but there was something about, I seem to remember reading something about the price of cocoa had come down. It was a, uh, the crops had been bumper, that, that sort of within a period of years. So they'd actually increased the size of various bars as a way of, um, generating loyalty um, among customers wow. and then as we've gone on it feels like now people have taken away my right to choose a chocolate bar that has more than 100 calories in it <laughs> so the problem I have now is if I want a Cadbury's caramel I'm going to buy two or a Yorkie because it's like well this is really small I know. <laughs> so I'll get two instead that, that, that's um so I, I've I have type one diabetes, so I don't I don't really eat chocolate anyway. I don't know why I'm talking about chocolate so much. I hate it. What other people can have, and I choose not to. But I'm also I've become carbohydrate fixated. So everything I look at now as a food stuff is a is a carbohydrate level because it's relative to a unit of insulin. Yes. So it's ten grams per unit. So you know even chocolate bars. I want them when I'm in a hypo. I want that stuff loaded with carbohydrate. I want more carbohydrate than has been made in humanity <laughs> piled into to my ingestive system and um, just to restore me so it, it sort of becomes you know i feel that there's lots of debate going on around things like lucas aid when they drop the um, drop the carbohydrate content for fairly good reason because we have a rising obesity problem in the uk mm-hmm. but then you've got you know diabetes sufferers coming out of the woodwork really you know with placards and stuff give our sugar back or something i don't know mm-hmm. yeah. but it's interesting it's interesting stuff 
Yeah, it's it's a, it's a whole kind of removing the sugar from Coca Cola and mm. all that stuff. It's like, yeah, we know it's bad, but if instead of saying there's food that's bad and there's food that's good, help people mm. make like better choices. Yeah, yeah. Rather than we vilifying, do, we, we do need far more education. We need mm. far more education. What well, one of the things that I really real fail, fail to understand is we have you know successive governments, not just one. But governments who talk about the need for health and well-being to be prevalent in society whilst selling off playing fields that children used to exercise on to house developers. Mm. Um, and that really does contradict itself, you know. So, uh, it, it's, I, I, think, I think it's evident and correct that um, schools under the curriculum were only recently required to, to, to actually have up to two hours of exercise with children curriculum based so if they go above that that's fine but the requirement you know it's bonkers Mm -hmm. bonkers that health and well-being and empathy and you know all all those important aspects of life can take a backseat always to science maths and english i mean i'm not saying they're more important but they're as important surely and that just seems so inappropriate to me and we, we, we we get these little diamonds into schools at five years old and we do so little to nurture their brains in the way that is you know proper Mm. and we yeah. we we leave a, i don't know why i'm pointing because we're on a podcast but for <laughs> listeners i'm gesticulating with my hands <laughs> um uh, we, we kind of leave it to the tail end when everybody's in hospital and sometimes a bit too late to shovel mm. the money at the not the prevention but at the the cure part and just mm. seems so imbalanced it is it is and yeah we've noticed it so i've got an 11 year old so he's right on the cusp of going to start in secondary school in September. And it's it's almost understanding what the schools aren't teaching. And so therefore we have to pick as parents, you know, pick the slack up. Um, yeah. But it's the, 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 the problems they're facing. We didn't face those problems. You know, no. you know what you said before about that children in an online space. Um, mm. Yeah, we spent time poring over Encyclopedia Britannicas to find out stuff. Yeah, or smash hits. Yeah, and <laughs> or both. Yeah, and it's <laughs> how do you, how do you protect I, them? Yeah, it's um, it's a really difficult space. I, I do some work in the darker side of that as well with a mm. with a company I'm involved in, um, and there's a lot of predatory activity out there, stacks of it. Mm. And the problem is, you know, it's like all of us. We don't know what we don't know. So a child doesn't know what a predatory, predatory intention is. Mm. They have no idea. So they can't judge it. So if, you know, they're in a game on Fortnite with their friends and a friend's friend turns up and starts playing and then can develop a relationship with that, with that young person whilst under a parent's roof, they have no concept of that person being anyone other than the one they identify themselves by. Mm. And um, that's a difficult area for parents because for lots of parents, they also don't understand technology that well. Mm. And the children probably know it better than they do. And, you know, I remember, you know, um, being a kid and if you want to go out and your parents say no, you probably climb down a tree or something, you know, Mm. and that's maybe their version of climbing, climbing out the bedroom window or something. It's just a modern day version of it. So, you know, we've got to be more protected. Yeah. Capcertified.com. Is that inappropriate to just put that in there then? No. Okay. no. And I'm interested for me personally as well. Mm. Because it's, I don't know what they don't know. Yeah. It's worrying. It's worrying. You know, I know quite a bit and I've got people around me that know a hell of a lot more. Um, and, you know, it's it's a worrying thing, like lots of worrying things, like, you know, what are children ingest and do they do enough exercise and are they going to be healthy their whole lives? All those things. It's not the most worrying thing, but, um, you know, it's a difficult area that I think the, uh, and w- with most social media platforms as well, there's no, there's no identity check. You don't have to verify your identity with anyone, full no, stop. We're, we're, there's legislation changes coming in soon, but then... Um, uh, Facebook have moved some of their database to the US. Um, so uh, as we saw in the media recently, so it's not governed by UK law. Um, so maybe gives them a little bit of a get out. Um, and this stuff is going on, you know, the, the, the big platforms of this world don't necessarily want to um, drive people away, you know if you've got to start to, to validate and an identity check and if you've got to start telling people the area in which their children are, are playing may be unsafe, 
as a as a social media platform that starts to get into dodgy ground that may not give them the sales platform they want. No. Mm. So you know, it's going back to that thing. I can I can understand the situation. I don't agree with it. We had this chat off air, didn't we? I can understand mm. the situation whilst not agreeing with it. Um, but you've still got to try and do something to protect the important people, which is the the children. Definitely, yeah. definitely. The, the, going back to that social dilemma program, we found it very interesting to hear that none of the the people who worked at these big platforms allow their children anywhere near them. Mm. Mm. That's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Well, very weird. Says it all. <laughs> says everything. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, but yeah. they don't they don't include that in their sales pitch <laughs> no. no i keep saying if you if you pay for if you don't pay for a product you are the product mm. yeah 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 i think that's the problem with social media as well it, or the you know not the problem because sometimes it's a fairly obvious issue but um people get involved in something that they then that they don't pay for that they then believe they have some ownership of mm-hmm. which we don't yeah. You know, we're not there for free for any other reason than they're making money in some way. And, and, you know, that's fine. That's fine in some ways. You know, I think it spreads a bit thin when it gets into areas of of absolute safety and protection. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a moral aspect in there that I think needs questioning. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we, we, we don't pay for stuff, so we can't demand of it, really. And at the lighter end of that, you know, whether our data is being used or, or grabbed or taken and used in other areas, we're kind of leaving ourselves open to by being on that platform in the first place. Mm-hmm. So it's difficult to complain about the known mm-hmm. as easily. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. So what's the what's the plan for world domination in future, Brian? Um, I'm going to do some world domination and motivational mapping shortly. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Another plug. Or, I, I, <laughs> sales is everywhere. Sales yeah. is everywhere. So why not just jump on the bandwagon, I say. Um, so I, my, my beautiful and lovely friend, Cassandra Andrews, is um, training me and certifying me in motivational mapping this very week. Um, so that will be the remainder of my week. We'll be head down studying like a good schoolboy. And um, I'm really excited about that as well. Mm. So I've I've had a, a five or six year growing love affair with motivational maps, um, which is a psychometric tool like many others, and they all have their space and no one is better than another, but they might be better for a particular situation or circumstance. Mm-hmm. Um, and ma- maps um, I really like. It talks about the nine key motivators that um, drive us and in a, 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 at a particular set time in our lives as well. So um, we're doing some work um, stateside with that at the moment. Um, And I'm kind of going to be one of those little excitable, I don't know whether it's right to say a greyhound at a greyhound track because they're kind of effectively hunting is sort of the essence of it. But um, I'm going to be like that sort of race, uh, racehorse is bad as well because we probably shouldn't have it. But an analogy that works, let's say an analogy that works without harming animals um, out of the traps to go at that market because I'm just, you know, desperate to to go and map the world (laughs) and everyone in it, everyone in it. So (laughs) expect a call soon. Everyone on this podcast and anywhere else in the universe, expect a call. It will be coming. And I think as well, I think as well, making the world better, you know, that's what kind of gets me out of bed in the mornings, improving the landscape and the community we serve uh, and spreading that out and having, I think if everybody's kinder to each other, you end up where the people not being kind of left in the corner of the room all on their own, they're easier Mm. to point at. Um, Mm. And, and, you know, we should all do that. And we were talking earlier about one person and the aspect of one person being able to affect change and you know one person can always do more than no people at all and can always gain the interest of another person to grow and grow and grow and we should never ever stop trying to do that absolutely mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. quick fire questions is next oh excellent that sounds exciting i know so here's here's james to lower the t- lower the tone even more <laughs> excellent question number one what is your secret talent Oh my word! Um, profanity, <laughs> probably. No, I like a good swear. swear. Yeah. yeah, I like a good swear. I d- <laughs> I'm not going to say any, um, but I d- I've got a favourite as well. It's really weird. I have a favourite swear word, and it's not a nice one. Okay. I, I, it's just odd. 
I love its use in language correctly. I think I might know which one it is. Um, yeah, I think you probably do. Yeah, yeah. It feels nice in when, in your mouth randomly. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that is another podcast. That's so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the feeling of the word, anyway. I'm just going to yeah. stop digging myself a hole that's, here. Yeah. Please do that's get in touch. <laughs> get in touch with, with Brian. <laughs> I, I, I was wondering how which part would have to be edited out, and it came right at the end. There we go. I don't know. Some, that, yeah, podcast gold. Podcast gold. There. <laughs> oh dear. Shall God. I thank you? That's made my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> it's all accidental <laughs> um okay so number <laughs> be professional shelly uh question number two is what should the first con i can't even say it james colony what should the first colony on mars be called oh We'd have to go back to the favourite word. <laughs> um, uh, Brian. Brian. Yeah, the Brian, Con- the Brian Connolly. <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy one. <laughs> oh, dear me. And question number three, what question can you ask to find out most about a person? I think if someone's being honest with you, what wouldn't you tell me? <laughs> what wouldn't you tell me I think we'll get there um, and then I, I, I think it's probably it's a bit like FBI tactics really you know it's a bit probably a series of questions if you think you're not getting the answer that you should be getting and um, I think body language has some indicators to that as well but I think what what wouldn't you tell me what shouldn't I know mm. good one. yeah it's mm. a scary one mm. Cool. And if we could take you back to your 18-year-old self, Brian, what advice would you give to you? I think there'd be a couple. One would probably be drink less, save more. And um, also, it's probably really not love every time, (laughs) I think, because I probably went through a proportion of my life falling in love with every person I met, really. And I think later in life, you realise you weren't really in love with that person. So I think it'd be that. And um, don't ever wear a skirt again. Okay. That's for the follow-up podcast. Interesting advice. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. So for our listeners, if you'd like to track down Brian and check out all of his links and all the different plates he spins, best place to find him is LinkedIn. Search for Brian Bush and the link will be in the show notes as well. Yeah, so you can send him a little uh, direct message if you fancy finding out what his favourite word is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or ask Michelle. <laughs> um, cool. We'll have, yes, have a fabulous week with your training. Mm. Sounds like lots of fun. Yeah, I- I'm looking forward to that. And I've really enjoyed this as well. Yeah, it kind of went to so. places I wasn't expecting, and that's really good. <laughs> I-, I really like that. He always does. I don't know. It just ends up being a little bit random, but that's where the where the beauty mm. is, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. It's Thank great. you. Thanks for joining us. No worries. Pleasure. Thanks everyone for listening. Check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com. Join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person. If you like this subscribe and tell your friends if you didn't like this subscribe anyway and tell everybody